started, I would like to make a quick announcement about um, the withdrawal of a new business agenda item uh, for the clerk annex. And so that has been withdrawn. So we will not be discussing that item tonight. Um, Commissioner Lazar is going to lead us in. Uh, oh, we're going to do roll call. Sorry. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> I felt you were excited about it too. So my apologies. Sorry, it was taking a minute for it to catch up with me. Um, Commissioner Meyer. Present. Commissioner Benson. Commissioner Freitas. Present. Commissioner Kraft. Here. And Commissioner Lazar. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will do a uh, salute to the flag. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kraft, we are going to do your oath of office. I'll make this easy. Yeah, Just stand. Should I stand with you? Does that make you feel better? Okay. Um, um, I, state your name. I'm Michael Kraft. Do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California and the Charter of the City of Eureka, that I take this obligation freely without any mental uh, reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter in the capacity of board member for the Planning Commission Board of the City of Eureka. I do you do. swear? Thank you. I think you just need to sign that. It's official. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to approval of minutes for the February 13th, 2023 meeting. Uh, I was here for the meeting. I read the minutes. They look good to me. I move approval. I'll second. I'm going to abstain. I was not here. Are you going to need it? I wasn't either. You can still vote. Can I, if, can I still vote? If yes, I you can. Okay. Well, I read the minutes, so uh, we'll, we can go ahead and Coke vote. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, Commissioner Meyer? Yes. Commissioner Fix is not here. Commissioner Freitas? Yes. Commissioner Kraft? Yes. And Commissioner Lazar abstained? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, we will open oral communications. This um, provides you the opportunity as a public to make any comments um, that are a subject not appearing on the agenda, but pursuant to the Brown Act, the Planning Commission cannot take any action on that item that does not appear. So if anyone's here that would like to speak on something not on the agenda, now would be your time. All right, we're gonna move on to new business, which is the C to F parcel surplus. Thank you and good, mean, good evening. Uh, Commissioners, thank you for being here tonight. So we're going to talk about the C to F parcel surplus this evening. And the C to F parcels are located on the north side of Eureka, and they consist of three parcels and a portion of the D Street right of way. The parcels are located just south of the boardwalk and extend from C Street almost over to F Street. Starting at the west end, the parcel located at the northeast corner of 1st and C Streets is approximately 1.13 acres, or 48,500 square feet. And at various times in the past, the site has contained residential apartments and boarding houses, warehouses, the Buna Warehouse building, and the inside track retail store. 
at least 45 very low income dwellings will be required on this site through the RFP for the housing element. The second site is the parcel located at the northeast corner of the intersection of 1st and D streets and is approximately 0.22 acres or 0.3 acres with the street right of way. With the right of way, the parcel is approximately 13,000 square feet and in the past it contained a saloon which eventually became a beer and wine warehouse. At least five very low income dwellings will be required on this site. The last parcel is located between D and F streets and is immediately adjacent to and south of the boardwalk. The parcel is approximately 1.34 acres or 58,400 square feet. And in the past, it's contained warehouses for feed, groceries and fishing gear, wharves and a fish packing plant. On this site, at least 45 very low income dwellings will be required. The Planning Commission must find whether the parcels are necessary for the city's use, are of such size and shape to allow development of uses permitted in the zone in which they're located, and that the disposition of the property is in conformance with the government code. As discussed in your staff report, all this, although the sites will be used for housing, housing doesn't actually meet the definition under the Surplus Lands Act for agency use. So the property is not required for the city's use. The size and shape of all three parcels can allow for development of housing or coastal dependent, coastal related or visitor serving uses. And there are several goals and policies in the general plan and local coastal program which support development of housing on these three sites. And in order to move forward with that development, the city must declare the sites surplus. So based on the discussion in your report, staff believes that the location, purpose, and extent of the proposed surplus complies with the California Government Code and City of Eureka Policy 2.01, and the project qualifies for a Class 12 exemption from CEQA, and I do have a suggested motion whenever you're ready, and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you. I will bring it back to commissioners for questions for staff. I have one question about um, how this relates to our housing element. I believe that we have a new adopted housing element that already incorporated this site as one of our sites that would accommodate some of our units for this housing cycle. Is that correct? Yes, the amended housing element that was just approved at the end of 2022 and certified by the, the uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development included all three of these sites. And that's what that was the 45, 45, and 5 units that I mentioned. Okay. So there already have been public hearings about this before the City Council. Um, is that correct? One or two? It, in the fact that they were included in the housing element, yes. Okay. Yeah, I think that we had a study session with them as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess one other question, just to clarify, even though I think it's already somewhat decided, would we be able to accommodate these units at a different series of sites? Is that possible or does it have to be these sites? If somebody has a site that's willing to talk with us about um, us having site control over it in one manner or another, um, we would certainly be open to the opportunity to talk with them. They just need to keep in mind that it's got to support a certain number of housing units and um, meet density requirements, be in the proper zone district, those, those kinds of things. But we're absolutely happy to talk to somebody about um, any site that they might have that's available. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for answering that. Just seemed like that might be relevant for anyone in the public who wasn't aware of that process that had already happened. Thank you. I guess my question was about, and I'm sorry if, if this has been made clear before, but um, is our housing element required to be certified? These are, this is a property in the coastal zone. Is it required to be certified by the Coastal Commission? It is not. The development that will be there will need coastal development permits, but. So is the general plan for the city effective throughout the coastal zone? 
It's not certified by the Coastal Commission. We're working on the LCP update uh, to get that certification done. So the 2040 general plan is intended to apply citywide, but again, it hasn't, the specific LCP hasn't been certified yet. So I guess it seems to me like there's a little bit of a tension there because through the certification of the LCP that we're having study sessions on to try to advance, it will formalize some of the goals and policies in the general plan that apply elsewhere in the city, but don't currently have that. I mean, I see. I just want to add that the Coastal Act has a provision that says that you don't um, need to get a housing element certified by them. So housing elements aren't typically part of your local coastal program. Yeah, because they happen at a much frequent, more frequent pace in modern era. Okay, and then uh, I think it was mentioned in the oral presentation and also in the staff report that this is one of the 14 city-owned parcels targeted for use for at least 330 affordable dwelling units, right? This is three. Three of those 14. Yeah. Three parcels, yes. Yeah, and that, uh, and that's the 2019 to 27 housing element implementation program that it's been targeted under? Uh, implementation program H34. Uh, I wanted to I know this is not before us but I just since we're talking about the 14 parcels that didn't include the other item that's been pulled from the agenda that that parcel wasn't part of the 14 right that's correct that's it was I'm not thinking. part of it okay and uh, as far as I guess I just had a question and this it was about the agency use thing and uh, this was kind of the I, I feel like there's been some changes to the um, the law for um, governing uh, public, I guess, I should, surplus land, right, in recent years. And it seems like it's in the spirit of making sure that it doesn't interfere with achieving housing objectives statewide, essentially, by making sure that lands get a fair shake. So um, in light of that, the agency use thing, I guess I'm trying to understand how that applies. And, and what you say in the staff report, which would seem really honest, was including but not limited to because that is the language of the law. I did pull it up for the meeting tonight. So doesn't that give broad latitude to interpret things beyond what's enumerated in those sections? And I'm not sure it would have a bearing here, but I just was interested to see what staff's position was with regard to how broad that can be. Expanded. So when I read that section, I looked at it and the examples of things that they gave were things like um, utility sites, watershed property, uh, conservation purpose land, demonstration land, um, educational purposes, and all of those sites related, or all of those things related to greenhouse gas emissions. Or there was also a part about buffer sites near sensitive governmental uses. Um, for example, a wastewater treatment plant. So to me, it seemed like it was more, um, utility related, um, environmentally related uh, for the buffers, uh, perhaps security, security related um, in some instances, but it just didn't seem to me like any of those things were broad enough to be able to say that includes housing. And that's fair, and I think it could get to the spirit of sort of, yeah, in the context of what's been used as examples within the law itself. Um, I guess one other question that came to mind just now was that, was this within the redevelopment area at one point, this parcel? I believe it was, yes. And I guess just for maybe both my benefit and maybe some of the, the public, like, can you give a little bit of a snapshot of sort of what the expectation or hope was at the time when the, because some of these buildings were, were removed to make way for development that never has obviously emerged. What was the goal at, in an earlier iteration of this? So I think um, generally the reasons that the existing, most of the existing buildings I think were removed was for safety purposes. We had some buildings in this area that had partially collapsed, um, had injured folks in those collapses. Some I think were um, probably close to collapsing. Um, I don't know if imminent was the term, but collapse was certainly possible. So once the 
those structures were removed, then the city started looking at what the plan was for this portion of the waterfront. And over the years, we've held um, a charrette and we've done some uh, community design work on this. Everything that's kind of been proposed in the past um, has included definitely develop on, development on this site. Um, visitor serving uses certainly on this site. Uh, open space, green space um, incorporated into whatever the developments are. Um, I think that's kind of just the general really high level idea for things um, for potential development on this site. My last question for now is just, I think I brought this up when we were talking about the housing element um, study session. Uh, and that is just that the Booner, house, the Booner warehouse was removed from this property in recent years and it was deconstructed carefully so that it could be built again or rebuilt. And I just, is there any update on that or is, I mean, this project wouldn't, it wasn't the expectation when it was removed that it would reappear here, right? It, yeah. So we don't have it, but, but it is still being cared for in some way that it could be. I'd have to double check on that for you. It's okay. been a while. I'm just going to ask because I just wonder about that sometimes. Yeah. I could yeah. see that easily it, being lost sight of. That's a great question. Yeah, I can find out and get back with you. Okay, thank you. I have something to add to the Booner Warehouse, if I may speak briefly. Um, you'll have your turn in just a minute for sure. Thank you. My question kind of picks up where uh, Commissioner Lazar left off, which is in practical terms, you know, what what are the remaining possibilities for visitor serving mixed use? Does, do you do you city staff see housing taking up all of this? Are we still talking potentially housing on the second floor, mixed use below? What what looks possible for that? So per the CW zoning, which covers all three of these parcels, um, housing is uh, conditionally permitted on the second floor and above with visitor serving uses um, on the first floor. I bet that was in the staff report somewhere, wasn't it? Like I read it and didn't stay. That's okay, I'm happy to say it out okay. loud. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. So yes, um, the RFP is still in process that will be going out very soon for um, all of the 10 remaining sites, not including the link housing sites. Um, sorry, 11 sites. But generally, I think that the descriptions for these um, sites are going to include something like I just kind of previously mentioned, where there's going to be mixed use structures, probably not covering all three of the lots entirely, but with green space and open space and housing above various kinds of mixed uses, not just retail kind of things um, on those sites. So while that could be our vision going forward, we'll have to just wait and see what developers come back with. Understood. I'm still a happy commissioner. Any other questions for staff at this time? All right, I'll open it up to the public. Just as a reminder, we do appreciate if you state your name and city of residence, as well as you have three minutes. So um, be mindful of your time. So if there's anyone here that um, would like to make comment on this particular agenda item, now would be the time. I'm uh, Ray Hillman. 1401 East Avenue, Eureka. I really came here to speak about the Clark Museum, and I'm surprised that uh, the Booner Warehouse came up because I, I was uh, one of the leading figures in the effort to try to save that building. And I just need to bring you up to date uh, that even though that warehouse was hand dismantled, the big timbers and other elements were moved to a, uh, a city storage yards uh, south of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Eureka Marina uh, through an unfortunate uh, uh, problem with communication, all of the timber was destroyed and there isn't any original material left even after all the effort that was made to save it. So uh, I, I am surprised people remember it. I wish we could follow through, but uh, 
I don't see anything uh, that would be practical with the warehouse. So uh, I'd like to speak later on the Clark Museum and thank you for this opportunity. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Dan Dion, 15 West Cedar Street in Eureka. Uh, just a simple comment that this, these particular properties are on the edge of just being blight. They're, they're in miserable condition. They detract from our waterfront. They detract from our boardwalk. So turning them into housing, which is desperately needed, seems to me to be an incredibly sensible proposal. Thank you, Mr. Dion. Hello, uh, my name is Adam Dick and uh, 1429 East Avenue, another East Avenue folks around here. So uh, I just have a couple quick comments and I will uh, first make it clear that I do obviously have a bias in how this all develops and uh, so make that clear. Um, and maybe this is a foregone conclusion, maybe housing is already happening there. But, but for me, when I look at these three parcels, the one that I really feel like maybe the city should hold on to or really reconsider the use is the one that parallels the boardwalk. And obviously, uh, significant develop there, development there would uh, affect our view, which is fine. Um, but I think when I look at that parcel, and I looked at it a lot today, I think one of my potential concerns, by the time you, uh, you know, put an access corridor through there, potentially a two-way street, angle parking, sidewalks, you've really eaten into a gigantic portion of that uh, piece of property. So there isn't a lot left for development closer to the boardwalk. Um, so I think there's that. I think another concern potentially too, and I know it's been talked about in previous design charrettes, is the concern with shading the boardwalk. You know, anything built too tall right next to the boardwalk will shade it for significant portions of the year and it'll be really, really cold. So I think, you know, always any design we always had seen or had considered was like, you know, very low next to the boardwalk to make sure that there's, you know, unobstructed view or also just, you know, not shading. So those are some of my concerns. I think that that parcel in particular seems to me, uh, if we're going to put a lot of people down there in housing to have a green space that's still open for people to recreate uh, down on the boardwalk is valuable to the community. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dick. Hi, I'm Robert Maxson. Uh, my mother and I are um, invested down in that vicinity and have been for generations now. And uh, we've seen things kind of play out naturally. And um, over the years, I, I would have to say that uh, through my father especially, that we've seen nothing but potential for what could happen down there. And to me, today, um, when this project came forward before the commission here, um, it was really surprising um, that it was so heavily weighted towards housing when previously, through the design charrette and everything, was all these other ideas. Um, and I remember in the design charrette, there was a lot of talk about hotels, um, housing, and the parking that would be required for those kinds of things and how quickly the parking could eat up potential for open space and all these other things. Um, I think we do need housing down there. It's all gonna be very important to have that mix. And I do want to applaud that we're finally moving forward. When we had the design charrette in 2015, we thought we were gonna go straight to RFPs and everything else. But we took time, when I say we, you, the city, took time to bring that, that into the parking assessment district, to take these steps towards fixing the general plan, the LCP, all these things. So I wanna thank you all for your hard work 
and let's just keep moving it forward as best we can taking all inputs and thank you appreciate your time thank you mr maxson Hi, I'm uh, Greg Pearson, um, one of the owners of the Bayfront Properties, Bayfront Lawn. Um, so we have the building where the restaurant is, and then we have the gravel parking lot on the other side of F Street. Um, so we're we're definitely, as Robert is, uh, invested in that community, and we've put a lot of time and effort and money into it, into that section of town. Um, I also worked with the city to provide property for uh, low-income housing on the Sunset Parcel with the idea that that was taking care of the um, low-income housing needs of the community. And and at the time, that, that was, I was going to provide more than they needed. So now I'm seeing that the boardwalk is being possibly slated for 95 more very low income housing units in a very short period of time from when we just did a, a deal and I'm just wondering what's driving that because I don't understand it and I, I think the community needs to understand what is required, what is available within the city inventory to meet those needs and why is our boardwalk the best place to do it. And I think those discussions need to happen um, before you, you re really can can decide whether that's the case or not. I don't have a problem with it being surplus because I think the city does need to move forward. I guess I have the question as to is this process going to mandate very low income housing units on there at a level of 95 units? That's about, I don't know, somewhere between 30 and 40 units an acre, which is a pretty high development for our type of area, which was like, what else is the boardwalk going to be? if we're doing this to it as part of this process. So I think the community needs uh, more information. Um, they have a right to, to know what the vision is. Um, and if you take this action, what vision will be required by the action you're taking? Um, because I did, you know, I do think housing is important and I've worked hard you know, with the city and you folks to, to help accomplish that. And, you know, now I'm seeing, that, oh, now we need another 95. So I, I would appreciate uh, education on how all this works and why we need to do this um, before we take action. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I just wanted to see if anyone else in the audience would like to come up because we do have someone uh, via Zoom we'll call on, if not. Okay. It looks like Kenny Carswell. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Kenny Carswell. I'm here uh, representing SN Servicing Corporation. Um, SN Servicing Corporation previously commented on the city's update to the housing element, particularly related to the redevelopment of city-owned parking lots. As outlined previously, uh, SN Servicing Corporation understands that the city is under significant pressure to comply with state regional housing allocation requirements. To be clear, SN Servicing Company supports the development of housing that is accessible to city residents at all income levels. Um, the city should not allow redevelopment without first analyzing potential impacts to the community, including but not limited to pedestrian safety, air quality, traffic impacts, and neighborhood compatibility. Uh, resolution to this is simple. Uh, the city needs to maintain ground level parking for local businesses and employers like SNSC. Uh, doing so will help protect the safety and security of businesses, employees, and patrons. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if no one has any further comments, then we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. I'm sorry, sir. I had mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that that is no longer on the agenda and it's been withdrawn. I'm sorry that you missed that portion. Well, 
I guess I'll just start us off by saying that um, I have kind of mixed feelings about this. I am totally in support of it conceptually, but um, I guess I'll say it is a little bit bittersweet knowing that so many people wanted so many different um, things for the site and it is such a prime site in the city um, and that we just haven't found a way in the last eight years since we did visioning to um, you know to achieve some of those other dreams I think some of the speakers who indicated you know support we really appreciate that um, and those who voice concern it sounds like partially that's coming from a place of wanting more information on the kind of design we would get um, out of this and it's really difficult to say until the responses to the RFP come in um, it seems like maybe a good method for guiding that would be reaching out to the to the city council um, and letting them know what your priorities are for that RFP uh, which is not something that we have control over here at the Planning Commission um, but I was hoping principal planner gets before um, you know we dig too much into this that you could just give a really brief overview of um, you know as one of the commenters said how all this works and why we need to do this I don't know if you can give like the 60 second answer to that um, but I think the Commission is pretty clear on it but it sounds like there are still some members of the public that are not as clear as they would like to be so when excuse me when the housing element was uh, adopted by the city council and certified by the state department of housing and community development in 2019 and 2020 early 2020 um, there was an implementation program in the housing element that required the city develop uh, a minimum of 302 uh, affordable housing units on uh, publicly owned property. So it was properties that were owned by the city of Eureka, as well as uh, a Caltrans property and uh, a couple of county owned properties at that point in time. So not long after the housing element was certified, we discovered that um, the properties that were gonna provide uh, 80 dwelling units uh, were constrained um, through uh, state funding and could not be developed for housing. So we started the search to look for replacement locations. The um, public had concerns with development on uh, public parking lots along 4th and 5th streets here in town. Um, we were able to uh, work with Mr. Pearson and others to be able to do what we referred to as the swap. Uh, we swapped uh, some of those parking lots for uh, the Sunset Heights properties that he mentioned. And then we still were short uh, of the 302 units that we needed to be able to provide and uh, looked around for other locations and added uh, a couple of more sites, including these three. Um, and now actually we can provide uh, as many as 330 uh, affordable units amongst the 14 total sites and those includes the three sites that link will be developing on at some point in the future so a little longer than 60 seconds but that's good though that was like 75 seconds um, and one other follow-up to that is it's my understanding that the way the surplus lands act worked it works is if you're going to surplus property it is required by law to go to affordable housing developers first they're first in line and there's no way to kind of jump the line on that. Is that true? In most instances under the Surplus Lands Act, yes. And it certainly is our intent that this, that all of these parcels are gonna go out to um, the housing developers. They have a different name for them, but um, absolutely those would go, all, go out to that list. Um, and, there are, and there is a list of other entities that uh, we have to send notice to like county parks and that kind of thing, so. So just, again, sorry, this is my last question, but just to drive this point home, is it accurate to say that either we can continue to sit on the properties and have them remain, remain vacant, or it needs to go out to housing and mixed use projects first? Or is that too, is that overly simplified? I, I think we could certainly 
I mean, we're not sitting on the properties. If somebody comes to us tomorrow and says that they want to develop on those, great. Unfortunately, now they're included in the housing element and they're going to have to do some residential on there. But since the first charrette happened in the, I don't even remember what year it was, the way, the really way back time, and then the one that happened in 2015, we've had, um, unfortunately, no interest from developers on doing anything on those sites. So that's another reason that we thought, hey, we could use these in the housing element. So um, I think that the, the opportunities now are to continue to hold on to them in the hopes that somebody would come forward and do development, um, include them in the, or include them in the RFP. And just because they're included in the RFP doesn't guarantee that we're going to get folks who are wanting to develop on the sites. So that possibility certainly exists and we'll need to figure out what to do in the future if that does happen. Okay. Thank you for letting me ask all those questions. I will say, uh, for a little context, when I first I, uh, got on the commission, maybe 2018, before the new zoning code had been um, approved, there were quite um, substantial parking requirements. Um, and that has been changed, obviously, as you guys know, pretty significantly. And I'm not entirely sure if people in the audience are aware of that change. No, am I speaking? So just for clarification, that change is effective on the inland side of the city? Uh, but not in the We coastal. are working on getting it done in the coastal zone, but it's not there yet. Correct. But there are other ways that um, developers could potentially reduce the number of parking spaces that are required on those sites. Right. It's kind of the same that's in the inland portion, correct? The kind uh, of density bonuses outs. and that kind of thing. Yeah. I think we kind of did a similar thing on that corner of whatever it is, F and second. Similar, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm asking this question for myself, but also for uh, people in the audience. It sounds like the devil meets... Uh, the, the rubber meets the road, we'll say. The rubber meets the road at the RFP. H how best can citizens affect what goes into the, the RFP? Like, I found myself agreeing on the shading uh, idea. How, how might the RFP say, you know, we'll preference uh, things that don't shade the boardwalk or we're going to require that it doesn't shade the boardwalk, other uh, concerns like that? Sure. So staff is putting together a draft of that RFP. Um, it will go to the city council. Um, I'm shooting for the first meeting in April. Um, so that would be a time when members of the public could provide comment either um, to council in written form before the meeting or come to the meeting and provide uh, comments at the meeting. Um, Staff is happy to listen to any thoughts or ideas that folks have. So if you want to send information to the planning department, we're happy to look at it. Can't guarantee it'll be in there, but it'll ultimately be up to council as, as to how that reads for all of the sites. Fair enough. Um, I want to see if this sounds right. So with the recently adopted housing element, we have committed that whatever, whenever development emerges on these properties, there's 338, or no, sorry, not 338. There's uh, 45, 45, and five. So there's 95 housing units that are gonna need to be a part of that equation. But it doesn't mean that it has to be tomorrow. It doesn't mean it has to ever happen, really, theoretically. It has to be possible and planned and kept in place until our next housing element cycle where we could reconsider it and shuffle things up but for right now that is the governing kind of plan for development on these properties for the most part yes um i i would just say that the city certainly wants and encourages somebody to come forward with a development proposal for those sites you can put them all together you can take one you can take two you you can take all three whatever works for you um i think that with the housing situation that we have here in Eureka, um, any units that we can provide any place is a good thing. So I think that's... We're being more proactive than, than jurisdictions might otherwise ordinarily be. Probably. Yeah. Um, I also note that uh, it looks like the entirety of the parcel is uh, within the appeals jurisdiction of the coastal zone. Is that correct? Probably. Okay, so so any decision made by us or the, the city council on the coastal permit and use permits that will likely be needed are going to be subject to potential appeal. 
That's the Coastal Commission. Correct, yes. So the RFP, you know, is an indication of what the developer is prepared to pursue from a permitting perspective, but nothing is a foregone conclusion until the permits are in place. Correct. But it does seem like the first bite at the apple for people that want to influence the trajectory of the development. So I think we should encourage people to participate. Would you bring up the motion? Thank you. Any further discussion or questions for staff here? No, but I'll make the motion. Great. Great. I move the Planning Commission adopt a resolution finding the surplus of the CDF parcels as exempt from CEQA and the location, purpose, and extent of the surplus conforms with the city's general plan and direct staff to report the commission's determination and any comments to the city council. I'll second that. I think we're are we ready for a vote. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Commissioner Lazar? Uh, yes. Commissioner Freitas? Yes. Commissioner Kraft? Sorry. Yes. And um, Commissioner Ma Mayor? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who came to give public comment. We appreciate when there is engagement. <clears throat> Um, it looks like we're ready for adjournment, unless there's anything else that I missed. No? We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>